If you're trying to heal from trauma, there are two things you need, tools and community. And before I started Crappy Childhood Fairy, the one place I found that was in 12-step recovery. When I first started, I was in a really bad place and someone suggested I check out the program for families of alcoholics. And I am definitely a family member with a lot of alcoholics in there. And especially with my parents, this is a huge reason why I have childhood PTSD. Now there are other programs and I checked a few out and even though I'm not an alcoholic, I attended hundreds of open AA meetings because I related to the life and death nature of their problem and mine. And I loved the kind of cheerful camaraderie and stoicism that I found there. So after thousands of meetings, after sponsoring about 300 women, I learned a lot, a lot that helps me do my work here teaching about trauma and helping people heal their symptoms. And also I learned a lot about who actually recovers. What do they do differently than other people and what kinds of meetings help that happen? So here's what I learned in my 12 step recovery. Number one, it's really possible for a group to flourish with guidelines, but no leadership. Now I didn't think that was possible. I know when I came in, I was really exhausted. I was one of those like kids from, oh, I was an adult, adult child of an alcoholic. But I was exhausted from feeling like if I didn't sort of run everything, fix everything, make everybody happy, it was going to fall apart. So I had this marvelous experience of just going, I could just sit there, the whole thing ran, and I didn't have to do anything. Two, the people who followed the 12-step program, especially those who participated in AA or at least used the big book of AA, seem to do better than most other people. And that's just something I noticed from being in meetings for a very long time and watching who recovered and who didn't. Sometimes I think the literature all by itself is not as strong as the original AA big book. And I know some people don't like the book. It might not be for them, but I just found it had a power and it had a clarity about having to work the steps to survive that really spoke to me. And I noticed people who, who used it did better. A meeting where no one is focused on the 12 step program, I noticed, and everyone's just telling sad stories is very depressing. And it's a sort of meeting that I would pretty much avoid and I would, Recommend you do too, unless you have tons of recovery and you can go there and kind of bring some life to it and talk about the 12 step program. You know, that's what a 12 step meeting is. People often are told, you know, go there, it's a support group, but it's technically not a support group. It's a place where people share their experience, strength and hope about working the 12 steps and how to do it and they show other people how to do it. So it's really, really important that there's a critical mass of people who have done it, who have recovered, who are talking about like, what is that like? How do you do it? And it's okay that new people come in and they're sad and they're just talking about sad stories, but it can't be, you know, when it's everybody, it really, you know, can really bring people down and you'll see meetings kind of fold if they don't have anybody who actually works the 12 step program. Um, the next one is, I don't have to save meetings and I don't have to save people, I learned. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I had to learn it because I went to a number of meetings that were sort of dwindling and dwindling and they weren't going very well. And I went for this one meeting where it was like a lot of people talking about how sad they were. And I went in there. I had at that point, I don't know, you know, 15, 20 years working the steps, a lot of recovery. And I would be there every week sharing, you know, I know how to do it. Here's how to do it. But this meeting, it just, it had just sort of like attracted a lot of people who they were just sort of not into that. They just weren't into it. They just wanted a place where they could talk about this week's installment of how messed up everything was. And I went to that meeting for a long time and I went like, you know, early on in my recovery and then middle and then later. It was the same cast of characters and they were at the very same level. And I was thinking like, why would they want to keep coming back to such a meeting? But I think for some people, they just want to talk about the problem. They just do, but it's not where you are going to get a breakthrough. And I certainly didn't see any of them get it. It was just a, you know, it was like a, it was like a never ending saga. The next thing I learned is that meetings are remarkably similar in structure and spirit 
from meeting to meeting and place to place. And even in different countries, I've been to meetings in Mexico, for example, I've been in the UK and of course the United States and different parts of the United States. And it's interesting because there are a few cultural differences. Like in London, they serve tea with milk. And in the US, they have like a pot of coffee. And, um, <laughs> and then in the meetings for families of alcoholics, not the alcoholics, it's usually herbal tea. <laughs> I wanted coffee. <laughs> I always felt a little bit like a bull in a china shop there. <laughs> ah, give me coffee. But um but there it's so it's a little different what people drink, but everybody's using the same literature. People are reading the same sort of preamble to the meeting and it's really remarkable because the way that a 12 step meeting is structured it is it's sort of um you know it's very skeletal really these these they're called the traditions and it's a set of 12 rules about you know, just principles of running the program. You can look them up online. And they work really well, and they work so well that wherever you go, it feels about the same. And so I've been to meetings where people didn't speak English, but I basically understood what people were saying because I knew the format so well, and they were welcoming, and they brought me the cup of uh, coffee in Mexico. Coffee, yes. <laughs> and um, I just could understand the spirit of the meeting because I'd been to so many and felt this, like, kinship with everybody there, even though I couldn't understand them. Uh, another thing I learned is it can be a bit culty uh, sometimes with people using the official slogans of 12 step and phrases from the literature and the clever little sayings like put the jug in the, put the, what is it? Put the plug in the jug and put, take the cotton out of your ears, little sayings like that. When I hear stuff like that, I would always be like, oh, culty. And, you know, whatever, <laughs> what is a cult? It's where everybody kind of agrees on the same thing. In a, if a cult is bad, it means you can't leave. <laughs> and boy, you can leave 12-step recovery. And many people do to their own detriment, right? But you're free to come, you're free to go, and you will see there a culture, and you'll be encouraged to adopt the culture. And over the years, I just learned that the the positive aspects of a culty place where everybody's sort of in agreement as what you what you should do is it encourages you to take take the stuff that you know to take actions on your healing like get a sponsor start working the steps you know if nobody tells you to do that you might not do it and if you boy would you miss out if you didn't do like if you don't have a sponsor and you're not working the steps you're not really doing it you're not you're just kind of like hanging out or on the periphery so if you really want what it has you do what they do. And what and if you find a group, you know, they say you should go to like six different meetings before you decide if the whole program is right for you. And I think that's great advice because different meetings have these different sort of personalities and cast of characters and different emphases. And it's really like an organic thing. Nobody really decides this stuff so much. It's an organic thing. There's a spirit of it, but there's a unifying spirit that I just found at almost every meeting. Some people are bothered because they go to a meeting and some of the people there, I don't know, they're like disagreeable. They hit on them. It's not, you're not supposed to, but it could happen, right? It's just people. It's free. You don't pay anything to go. And the people who go, go there, not because they're perfect, but because they have problems. So, you know, just a heads up is that sometimes you'll go there with this idealism, like, oh, all these people, they have it all together. And then you see somebody doesn't have it all together. And it's easy to think, I knew it. I knew this whole thing was BS, <laughs> but it's not BS. It's that people are coming at sort of all different stages of recovery. And it's really good to have boundaries because, for example, yes, um, you know, there, somebody could hit on you or somebody could criticize you. It's rare. You know, it's a very strong culture of just sort of like let people speak, let them be themselves. It's a very positive culture in that way. And by the way, people don't talk about like politics or work. If they're, if they're following the principles, all that stuff is left outside. So there's less to divide people there. You know, it feels great. Actually, it was the first time in my life that wasn't like this big thing for me. I used to be very, very like into, I believe this and I'm into this and I'm this kind of person. And, and I, I didn't like anybody who didn't agree with me. And the great thing about 12 step recovery when I started going is nobody talked about it. So I didn't really know. I mean, you can, you know, you can see a few differences in people, I suppose. But um, as they say in the big book of AA, it's like we're like people on a lifeboat, you know, drowning people in a lifeboat. And so anywhere where I was with people who also like really needed to be there because 
because of whatever was going on with them. If it was drinking for me, it was though. I didn't have, I didn't know what it was yet. I just I thought I was just messed up, but I, I had complex PTSD. So I was getting very dysregulated all the time. And it was very regulating for me to have a group of people that I could just go to any time. I didn't never had to be alone. It always was a little bit festive. You know, I it was a little bit like the party I always wished I was invited to. And I, uh, people were always generally pretty welcoming to me. So it was, it was a very positive thing. Um, but yes, there were flawed people. And I sort of went through this disenchantment in the beginning when I thought they all have this thing, it's going to be great. And then I found out that who you meet there is people who also have, you know, complex PTSD or alcoholism or codependency or whatever it is that you're checking out. And then, you know, people who have this kind of problem, including myself, often how we experience each other is we'll be like, oh, this person is so great. They're so recovered. And then I always see pe people are like a planet, right? And then nighttime comes and you see the other side of the planet and they have, there's something about them that's like squirrely or cold or harsh or not the person you thought you knew. And it can be really alienating, but that's the nature of the problem. That's why the recovery is necessary is because there's this harsh edge to our personalities, which have their origin, you know, in what happened to us. They're now being generated by our neurology. They're, they're in our culture They're You know, there's a lot of stuff going on to overcome and it's going to be a layered process to heal. But what is so great is when you have tools, which is what the 12 step program is and a community around you to help you. That's a very powerful combination. Like those two things, you can go a long way. Now, most of the reasons we go to 12 step recovery, whether it's drugs or sex addiction or whatever it is, most of the reasons we go have this dark side of the planet <laughs> or the other side of the planet that comes around that is, uh, runs away from people when things start to get real or we start to feel criticized or even just feeling seen. Like when people sort of see what it is, maybe it feels really good to tell them the truth about what's been going on in your life. And then there's this contraction where you're like, Ugh, I don't want to be seen. And so we pull away from people. And what I think the 12 step consciousness sort of does so well is it it's very simultaneously accepting, but structured. And there's by osmosis, people sort of tend to learn an etiquette where we allow each other to sort of have a bad day. We just don't take abuse. <laughs> Very rarely have I seen this, um, but I have seen where people had to be asked to leave or something because they were being disruptive, but very rarely. Everybody, you know, everybody is longing to be accepted and to have a group of people where they belong. So that's just that right there is, is gold. So, um, Powerlessness. A lot of people balk at that. The very first of the 12 steps is admitted we were powerless over mm, whatever it is for you. Alcohol. Admitted we were powerless over alcoholism. That's the program I was in. And our lives had become unmanageable. So I kind of came to feel, so that's in Al-Anon where I used to go, the first step is admitted we were powerless over alcoholism and our lives had become unmanageable. And the qualification for membership is that there's alcoholism in a friend or relative. So no problem. You know, I qualify a hundred times for it, but I started to feel after 25 years that I needed to identify more specifically with what I am powerless over. And yes, yes, I'm certainly powerless, powerless over other people's drinking, but it's so much more than that. You know, I'm powerless over in here. I'm powerless over my reaction to people when I feel threatened or abandoned. I'm powerless over my ability to stay productive and pay attention when I'm anxious. So I have a lot of these things that I'm powerless over. And so people go, well, why why are, why do we have to say that? Isn't that sort of like undermining ourselves? Don't we have power? And I think the answer is complicated, actually. We're there because we couldn't really do it. We couldn't pull it off. If we could have pulled it off, we wouldn't go, right? So there is that powerlessness. But I would like to say that also, when you do work the 12-step recovery, you're not powerless. You, you know, power comes into you. Power enters into you and you start to have the power to become slightly better a little bit every day to actually work the program to actually, you know, get clarity about like, ah, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm, this is where I trip and fall when I'm dealing with people. And, uh, and then clarity about this is what I need to do instead. 
And we, we, we're powerless sometimes to do just constructive things like just sit down and do the meditation or to sit down or to, to make the phone call and contact someone and ask them to sponsor you or just make the program call. You know, I really came with a different idea of what is power in the course of my 12 step recovery that um, because that was taken from the original people who founded the 12 step program, the alcoholics, like they just could not stop drinking. But I didn't think for me, I had something quite exactly like that. It wasn't quite the same. I don't know, you could debate that, but but <laughs> I did understand like powerlessness means I don't know what to do. I might know what to do, but I can't do it. And there were days I was just so down, I just couldn't get up and brush my teeth and take a shower. That is a lack of power. That's a lack of power. So you'll often hear me in Crappy Childhood Fairy, you know, in these videos talking about like filling up with our inner power. And that's a lot of what the higher power concept is. There's higher power, there's inner power, wherever you're getting it, you know, it needs to be in here for you to be empowered. And I've never really liked the word empowered when we say, oh, well, I'm going to empower this community. Like, I think that's a little bit grandiose that people, people each are endowed with their own power. We just can't always get to it. We can't always get to it. But each, you know, each person is a sovereign and unique and beautiful being. And there is power there, but we can't get to it because of the damage, because of whatever it is, the, you know, the drugs, the alcohol, the trauma, we cannot access the power. And it's actually like, it's happening on a neurological level. It's happening on a chemical level. It's happening on a spiritual and emotional level. And it's happening on a social level too. You know, we just don't have the power to like be appropriate or kind or polite sometimes to keep our mouths shut. We don't have the power to speak up sometimes. And so powerless, you know, to just not have the ability to be you and to make choices about what, what you're going to do and not do. I mean, you know, many of you know what it's like to be there. I sure do. I've noticed that the people who recover versus those who don't tend to recover. I mean, a lot of people will sort of fall away or stick around, but be stuck. And they'll be sort of like repeating the same stories again and again. One of the things I know I've definitely noticed about the people who move forward is that they're very open about what the problem is. They're not trying to look good. They're not reluctant to admit it. In fact, sometimes I had this, I've seen it in other people. I don't think it's like a hundred percent of everybody recovers this way, but this kind of wind blows through your spirit where you just like, Oh, it just feels so good to get it all on the table and go, you know what, you know, can I tell you some of the stuff I did? And then in 12 step recovery, you also, you write this, that's the 12 step. You admit you're powerless. You come to believe that there's a power greater than you. You get to understand that the way you will. And then you turned your will in your life over to the care of that power. And that was always, a lot of people get stuck there too. Like, what do you mean? That sounds very culty, out of control, religious. And one thing that was explained to me that was helpful because I had a lot of resistance at the beginning. Um, eventually I had no resistance. I'm just like, please, I'll do anything. Just help me. But what it was is that the will, if you get a sponsor and you take suggestions and you work through these steps, that is how you turn it, your will in your life over. You're just like, I'm going to take the suggestions and do the thing that all these people around me say works. And it, even if you don't believe in God, you can notice that there are many people in your group, if it's a good group who are functioning really well. And from their story, you can tell that they once had the problem you had. And that's, that's very compelling. You know, it's like, you know, so you know, and that's a little bit what I do here on crabby childhood fairies. I talk about what it's like to have childhood PTSD. And I, I see these wonderful stories in the comments of people who are like, this describes what I have. See, cause I was alone all that 25 years of, of 12 step recovery. I didn't know. <laughs> I thought I was different. I thought I was weird compared to everybody else there. And I would say now a lot of people in 12 step recovery have complex PTSD like I do. And the people who have that, they really love to have a, a daily program because what childhood PTSD does is it can really dysregulate the mind, the neurology, your body, you know, it's got to be daily and not everybody sees it that way. There's like, I was going to meetings sometimes where the sponsors there were like every month of the year, we're going to work one of the 12 steps. And I, I just would have died if I had done that. I'm not knocking it. Like every person has a pace and has the right match for a meeting and a sponsor. But for me, I was like this close, you know, to not making it in my life, staying alive, honestly. And 
you know, thankfully somebody came along and showed me something I could do like right now, right now to start feeling better. That was called the daily steps. And later, much later, more recently, seven years ago, I adapted it and started calling it the daily practice. Took it out of the 12 step milieu, still give it away for free as I did in 12 step, but made videos and blogs about it and materials. And there is a free course you can take from me if you wanna learn what you would have learned from me if I had sponsored you back then, but now you can learn it here amongst all the people who relate to having complex PTSD, which is kind of cool in my experience because the way that I was so intense about like, you gotta work the steps, you gotta do it every day. Like not everybody related to me. They thought I was a bit of a zealot, you know, but each person needs to do what they need to do. And I really wanted to get better and I did, I made progress. I definitely had slow times, but I had like fast times. I had just miraculous awakenings where things move forward rapidly. So one of the things, this is something I learned that I hadn't known before 12 step is it feels really good to help out. And you start with the chairs, <laughs> you know, like when you first come in, even if you don't know what's going on, you can just go help set up the chairs or put away the chairs, you know, put folding chairs. They're always this like dinged up church basement chairs, you know, and helping with that. It's like, next thing you know, you belong here. It feels really good. And you, you, you feel like you, you get to be there. You have a ticket and if you have what we have, it's, you know, that feeling is very hard to find that you belong because that's, we don't feel like that a lot. We're used to feeling very outside of things, not really understanding how, how do people know how to act in this group? What's really going on here? So when you do the chairs or you help make the coffee or you put it away or you wash the cups or you help lock the door, or you count the money, or you, you, you secretary the meeting. You, you know, a secretary is a person who comes to the meeting early, gets out the box with all the literature, puts it out, gets the book, makes sure everybody, all the positions are covered of who needs to do what. And then they, they sort of, um, they guide the meeting through the phases of the meeting. Nobody is in charge. Is that insane or what? Nobody's in charge and it works. But when you do a service position like that, it, um, it does help the meeting and it helps you. It helps you even more. And I used to think they were saying that as a platitude, but then I started accepting responsibility to help with meetings. And later there were times I had meetings at my house. I secretaried meetings in parking lots over the holidays when it was freezing outside, you know, just so that people would have somewhere to go. And it's, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to have a good day if you go and do those things. So that was a big lesson to me. I didn't understand that before. Before I had 12 step recovery, I mean, I was really zeroed in on like, I need people to understand me. I need people to not leave me. I need people to recognize the value of me. And those are good, nice things, but they weren't going to fix me and they weren't going to come to me because I was so ragged with my dysregulation and my trauma symptoms that people didn't really like me or want to be around me and they didn't respect me. That's what was going on. So 12 step was a place I could go every night. Oh my gosh, I was so lonely back then. I mean, I had just alienated everybody. And then I got this solution, this thing I call the daily practice and boom, my mind came back and my body came back. I had been in this, I, I used to have like this really like gray skin and I just smoked a lot of cigarettes and sat around and felt bad about things. And I sort of like, I pinked up like a baby, you know, like blood was flowing through me and I could feel this life coming into my body. Like it was a really mystical experience. It was a spiritual awakening when I started going and I didn't even have to really do anything right for that. I just, I don't know, like the moment that I needed it collided with the availability of it. And the friend of mine who showed me this daily practice and she was from AA and she said, I think you should go to Al-Anon or something where people like you go check it out. So I went and I just started to change so fast. And next thing you know, <laughs> I was exercising, which I never did before. I was so just like, <laughs> I was exercising. Um, I was trying to dress a little more nicely. I was trying to be a little more positive. I was organizing hikes for other women, you know, just things like that. It made me really happy. It was like a radical change. And, it, and, and there was this culture there that was like, okay, you know, you could, you could use your time when it's your turn to share, to like blame and complain. You, nobody will stop you exactly, but you, you learn it just, you absorb the culture of the thing. Like, yeah, that's not really what, what, what 
catches on with people here. People feel connected when you when you talk about like, so I had this problem today, and so I tried this thing I learned here in the literature or in the meeting, or I called somebody, and then I did something different, and here's how it felt. And that is like medicine for every person in the room. And no matter how new you are, I encourage you like be the medicine and being the medicine doesn't mean you deny or suppress what you're struggling with. You get to talk about that, but just also say, and I made it to the meeting and it feels really good to sit down in the chair and just know that I'm with you. Just say that, that right there, this like wave of healing goes through the room. It's a very magical and spiritual place without anybody having to preach or teach or, you know, it's very powerful. And that that just got into my bones. It got into my pores. It just started. I had a physical sensation of my lungs starting to heal. My lungs were very messed up. I was a very heavy smoker for a long time. And I started to have this sensation that they were healing. And for the first few years of my 12 step recovery, I was sort of on again, off again with cigarettes. I tried and tried. I couldn't really do it. And then one day, boom, cigarettes were gone. So I hadn't really done 12 step to try to stop smoking, but then I did. I mean, I was trying to stop smoking. I just wasn't expecting a 12 step program for families of alcoholics to help. And, um, and then one day, I don't know, I was just having a very hard time three or four years into it. A lot of, I had a trauma storm, a lot of bad stuff had happened. And I was really finally doing something I thought was really stupid when I came into 12 step recovery. I prayed. I did. I prayed. And I, I felt like I just, my mom had died of lung cancer, actually. She had just died of lung cancer. Then my grandmother died of lung cancer. And I went home to visit my stepdad. And I sat on the steps and I just was like, oh, I just, I, he's just took care of his, his mother, my grandmother. And, and he took care of my mother, both through their lung cancer. And he didn't even realize that he had quite advanced cancer. He survived. He's still around, <laughs> but he cared for two of his loved ones dying. And he was devastated, of course. And you know, that just like, like lack of attention on himself. He, he was at stage four with his cancer when when he realized he had cancer, he had been in such a state of self neglect, caring for people. That's when I came home. And I knew that if I were to just sit there and light up a cigarette, that was just effed up. I just didn't want to do that to him. And so they say like, you can't do, make these changes for somebody else. But I had a hundred reasons, mostly my own. Mostly I was ashamed of being a smoker and I thought nobody would date me, which is kind of true. But for him, I just was like, okay, that's it. I prayed. I'm like, please help me. I just can't sit here and smoke in front of this person who has just been, you know, totally had his heart ripped out by lung cancer. Both my grandmother and my mother were heavy smokers as well. So that helped me. <laughs> that helped me. And um, it, so it was a few years before I really kind of yielded to the whole 12 step way of life of like actually praying. And I had a lot of like, I just had, you know, I was not raised that way and I had a lot of prejudice against it. And I found in 12 step a way that I could try that sort of thing without any sort of baggage of being this kind of person or that kind of person. It was always just suggested, you know, through prayer and meditation, we try to improve our conscious contact with God as we understand God. And I could handle that. I could handle that. And then next thing you know, I did have, I, I began to have a much more vibrant relationship and a conscious awareness like, oh my gosh, there is a higher power. And that changes everything. Like once, once I realized, once I came to believe that that was true, you know, either it's everything or it's nothing, right? If there's a higher power who cares about me, that's like a huge game changer for everything about life. And I also have been free in 12 step to then abandon that position and go, no, this is all crap. I don't believe it. And then to go, oh, now everything's bad. I'm back. So there's a lot of freedom there. Like nobody tells you what you have to believe. So I love that. Sponsoring. I sponsored many. I told you like 300 people. It's a thankless job. <laughs> Sometimes it's really neat and you meet people. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, you're taking a lot of calls, you're trying to help people, most of them will end up resentful at you and quitting. <laughs> Some of them will have this great transformation. 
but you know, it's not everybody. And, and like very early on, I learned, I can't make anybody recover here. I can't like manufacture the experience I had. I can show them what I did faithfully, like really be honest about what I did and they can have their own experience with it. And from time to time, people would just boom, you know, they'd awaken, they, they carry on now they've passed it to so many people and it's lovely to see, but Oh, no pressure because I'm not really doing it. I'm just showing them what I did. And if you're just honest, you're just saying, this is my experience and you take your investment out. You don't have to, this doesn't have to result in anything for my sake, you know? And if you end up not doing, taking my suggestions, I might not keep working with you because it's not really like, I'm here to work with people who want to follow my suggestions. And if you're not into it, then find somebody else or, you know, set me free to work with people who, who do want to try my suggestions. And so that <laughs> I, I had much more peace with how not everybody takes to it. But everybody that I tried to help, even like, there were occasionally people who were just so mean and like critical or they gossiped about me or, you know, ah, and, um, but it all helped me. It just did me a lot of good. And there's no way I would be doing crappy childhood fairy today if I didn't have all that deep experience. I mean, I think I reckon I spent about 20 hours a week, either in meetings or sponsoring women helping them or occasionally being sponsored myself. I'm, you know, a small proportion for me compared to how many I was helping, sometimes a dozen women at a time. So I just really, some people are like that. Some people never sponsor. Some people sponsor a little in a very focused way. And I think that my style, my gifts, they result in, you know, I'm a little bit more of a one to many person. YouTube works great for me. And so that's what I did, but it all helped me. When I'm talking to you about what works, I'm reminding myself of what works and I'm taking myself out of that negative, you know, spinning and I don't know, I just go into all this self-pity very easily, really, <laughs> without my principles that I learned there. So, yeah, I mentioned the people who, um, who take a long time to actually work the steps. There's this idea um, of people who wait a year to start dating. Okay. <laughs> and so the woman who sponsored me, she said, don't worry about that. You're going to go out and get your experience and that, and then you're going to be working the steps every day and it will help you surface what you need to learn about that, <laughs> which was true enough, I guess. But for people who are not working the steps or working them very slowly or kind of working on it like homework, but not really like throwing themselves face down on the floor and like begging for recovery. <laughs> I don't think that waiting a year is going to solve anything. It's waiting the year is good. But during that year, you have to be working some kind of a thing for a transformation inside. And transformation has a chance when you're not out there just pursuing again um, a relationship to fix you. That's not everybody's fix, but that was certainly my fix. You know, a temporary fix in hell as my, 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 my sponsor used to say a temporary fix in hell. You know, you think if you're going to meet some guy and it's going to, you could get some guy back, everything would be great. A temporary fix in hell. And it didn't make sense to me for a long time, but now I get it. <laughs> now I get it. And many, maybe you do too, that you can't really like grasp at a relationship and it's going to solve everything. When you're walking around with trauma, you know, you'll just sort of import the same drama from how you always get into that relationship. And there'll be a slightly different spice, some paprika here, some cumin there, you know, but it'll be a little different each time but it sucks. <laughs> it always sucks. And so when this change comes inside, just a whole new level of things can start to happen on the exterior of your life. The people you meet, the circumstances, the work you do, all of that can change with this transformation inside. And making that transformation inside is no, it's not for the faint of heart. Like the more real and honest you can get with your sponsor, with your group, the more transformation can happen. So here's another thing. Some people make meetings about a lot of things other than the steps. They make it or they make it about the traditions or the concepts. I've seen meetings like that where they the traditions are these things for governing individual groups. The concepts are for governing the overall organization. And there's these people who take those and they work those for their own life, with the, which they were never meant for. I'm just going to say that. I know some people like really like it, but um, I, I guess I don't, you know, if I'm going to be in charge, which I'm not, if I were in charge, I'd be like, well, but are you working the 12 steps? Those are the ones that are really like, 
to get to the heart of what is the reality of your condition. Where is it that you really are having suffering and where what is broken for right now what in you needs healing like to get real about that is a huge thing so if you're distracting about these other ideas that are more about like how a group brings in money or you know whether people talk about i don't know it's not the same thing you do they work beautifully for running a group though the breakthrough tends to come with the hard part where you're getting criticized and it feels unfair and you hate your sponsor and you think it's a bs cult and then you can see where it is you're going wrong. <laughs> so in my hit, this, I'm just telling you, these are things I learned in 12 step. So sometimes I'd be sponsoring somebody and at first they'd be very polite and agreeable and they'd do whatever I suggested and they would call when they said they would call and everything was great. And almost everybody, if they really do this work, they're going to hit a wall. They're going to hit a wall of resistance and just be like, this is bullshit. I'm not doing this. And anyway, you know, this reminds me of my mother or that was my thing. This reminds me of my mother. She can't tell me what to do. So that happens. And so you're not really, you're not really over the hump of really, you know, getting into the process of recovery till you stick around for that and you talk it through and you work the 12 steps through that till you're on the other side. This is where a lot of people run away or they drop down into a fake level of doing it where they can talk the talk without ever walking the walk of being a person who does recovery. And there's a lot of that. And a lot of people come in and their bullshit detector is like, this, this is a lot of talk, not walk. And you are correct. And um, you'll be one of us too soon, <laughs> talking and talking. Walking, it's kind of like, um, you know, may you have it now because when I say walking, I mean like to actually have the courage to show up honestly and work the 12 steps is a very big deal. And you might be powerless to make it happen at the time you expect, but stay with it. It's a wonderful thing and it, it will sort of carry you through if you show up honestly for it. So here's a, here's an epiphany. I learned this in 12 step and I still, and this is something I often talk about in crappy childhood fairy, the epiphany, the thing that you discover that you never saw before. Here's, you want to know what it is? Nothing is being done to me. Nothing is being done to me. There've been a couple times when like somebody pointed a gun at me once and I had to give them my money. That's what happened. And I laid on the ground as they said, and they left. All right. So something was done to me. And there's been some other things in my life like that. But for the most part, this churning, like, uh, you know, anger and objection to the way things are, you know, just ruminating and perseverating on ah, the problems, how I feel, what's bothering me, that the every once in a while, when I break out of that, and the 12 step program helped me do that, I was like, Oh, gosh, I'm manufacturing that myself. And that when I stop churning on it, I can actually you know, take actions that make my outer conditions a little better, that keep me disentangled from people who are problems for me, who make life unhappy. It's not that that doesn't happen. There are abusive people in abusive relationships, but ultimately in healing, we learn not to be in them. So another thing is I can get along with and enjoy friendship with all kinds of people. And I love that. That was a big game changer for me. People who are different culturally, politically, economically, spiritually, different parts of town, different countries. Like it just, ah, that's a really nice thing, you know, to just be able to, to uh, enjoy just about anybody. I don't enjoy every person, but every kind of person is totally enjoyable for me. So there's also a lot of ways to be phony in 12 step. You can be a know-it-all, you could be shallow, like there's these shallow old timers who just preach platitudes, but they never actually work on themselves. And I guarantee you, like the people who stop doing the work of the 12 steps, they lose the benefit of the 12 step. And some people will just go ahead and keep talking like they're there at the top of the mountain and know everything, but you can feel it. You could, you know, our nervous systems are quite sensitive. So when somebody is like, on fire and very alive and has got that spirit of healing going on in them. You feel it and it's attractive. And people who are just like lecturing you, eh, not so much. So just like everybody, we let, you know, everybody gets to be in the meeting. Everybody's in a different place on a different day. Eh, it's okay. Here's a downside. It can feel clickish in 12 step groups. And <laughs> That, you know, there's some truth in that. There's, there, there are cliques of people who hang out together and it hurts if like a group of people goes out to dinner and they don't invite you. 
a really good meeting is very inclusive and especially reaches out to the new people and says, do you want to come to dinner with us? And that is part of what 12 step recovery, like the 12 step, they say, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others. And one way you do that is by including people who are new. And yeah, sometimes they're pretty rough on the edges and they are talking about problems and you'd rather just sit and talk about fancy things and recovered things with other people, but it actually feels really good. It's very strengthening to include everyone. And that is how the whole meeting operates. That what, what gives it life, that, that's what empowers it. Gossip ruins groups. When there's gossip and people ganging up on other people, I've seen it a few times. I've had it done to me. And it's not only is it horrible to be sort of ganged up on, but it ruins the group. The group dissolves. Outside issues can also ruin the group. And so a lot of times if there's big political stuff going on, um, that when people start, it's, that's, that's one of the traditions. You leave it outside. You don't talk about professions or politics and it's outside. You, and, and, and that helps it be inclusive and helps everybody feel the unity that they have and not the usual divisive stuff. But some meetings relax that. And I've certainly seen that a lot in the last several years. They relax it and they just start bitching about politics. And those meetings don't survive. They just sooner or later, they implode. It's, it's not inclusive. It's not loving. It, it just sort of like undermines the spirit of that magical spirit that comes and helps people with their recovery when they have unity. Um, people in their first year of recovery sometimes have the most healing things to share. So really, you know, I came to recognize there is no time. Somebody like, I got 25 years, you know, I, I have just three months. But sometimes it's the person with three months who is most awake, who has the sharpest insight and the most healing thing to say. So I've always loved being around people who are new and open to it and having the experience and, you know, giving their all to try to have the recovery. There's no, there's no hierarchy of time. People are more wonderful than you realize. <laughs> and also they're more fragile sometimes than, than you realize. And that's something I learned hearing what was really going on in people's lives in that circle of chairs in 12 step meetings. I used to think I was the only one who had that much pain. And, um, yeah, I found out like you can't always judge a book by its cover. <laughs> there are a lot of ways people can do recovery and where people are genuinely happy and opening open to helping other people work the program. That's a good sign that what they're doing is working for them. That's how, you know, people who are not offering help to others, they're not really doing it. So if you want to, you know, when you go check out six different meetings, just ask yourself, do I see people when they say who, who's willing to sponsor? Does the hand go up? Is there a lot of that? Is there none of that? If there's none of that, keep going, find another meeting. That's no good. So when it works for you, you kind of want to get up on the rooftop and share it with everyone. <laughs> it's so exciting to share. And again, not everybody is cut out to sponsor, but everyone is encouraged to sponsor. And a sponsor is just somebody who's worked the steps before and shows you how to do it. I didn't always do this, but when I dressed nicely for meetings, people were more interested in what I had to say. <laughs> That's true. And I'll be honest about something too. When I got married, people were more interested in what I had to say. And <laughs> when I got divorced, they stopped being interested in what I had to say. And then when I got married again, you know, there's people can't help but sort of project that they will get from you what you have. And there's some truth in that. In the end, when they say, if the person has what you want, you know, ask them to sponsor you. And I'd always say, you know, I may be going through a divorce right now, but for me, that was recovery because I had a delusion that I should get married in the first place. And it was an honest mistake because we had some kids. <laughs> so we did that. But what I have is a way to get free of my delusion. And what I have is a way to be empowered instead of beaten down by my problems. And so I would always sort of stand by what I have is a way to recover. It's important to remember that many people in the room already feel excluded and alone. They feel that way everywhere they go, but they come in and they're the new people. They see people, they know each other's names. They know where everything is stored. They, you know, they, they know the room, they know the group. It's good to be inclusive of them and not to say, you know, when you're sharing, don't say stuff like we all know that da da da, or, you know, remember when we had that great party last year? Well, you don't say that. 
Instead, you always speak for the benefit of the new person in the room, for the vulnerable person in the room. And think, consider their sensitivities and consider what would be helpful to them. That will, it's interesting because that will, that will orient your thinking for your own self toward the most important principles. It's a good thing to do, even though it's fun sometimes to be like, oh, I want to tell a funny story. Funny stories are great, but remember the people in the room who are new and vulnerable and already feeling excluded. And finally, if I catch myself thinking catty thoughts and mentally criticizing people and thinking I know better than them about how to do things, I learned it probably means I need to work on my own recovery. That that catty judgmental feeling of other people, just it's, it's just like the red flag going, Anna, you're falling off the beam now. And it means I need to come back up. And so every day I come back to that that strong awareness, that sort of right-sized thinking, that truth inside, the well of power, by doing my daily practice techniques. And a lot of you watching have taken it this free course already, but I do have a free course called The Daily Practice, and you can learn this, and it's, it, it works on a number of levels. It can help just process stressful thoughts. It can help you get emotional relief when you're upset. But in the end, it can also help you kind of find your center and find your truth and begin to feel uncomfortable. It's like, you know what? I'm kind of veering into something that's not me or that is not cool with me. And I need to just come back. And the daily practice helps you know that line and come back and feel good there. Now, I know a lot of you have 12-step recovery too. And a few of you, I don't know, you've tried it and you don't like it or you would never do that in a million years. And a lot of people say 12-step saved their lives. So I know there's a lot of different experiences here, but if you've had some recovery in 12-step, what were the things that worked for you? Do you have tips to add to this? Let's hear about it in the comments. And then keep in mind, a lot of people here are in early recovery from childhood PTSD and sometimes from alcohol and drugs. So if you have terrible things to say about it and how it's so rotten, be mindful and inclusive of the vulnerable people in the room. Maybe don't trash the program that might be the thing that saves their lives. But talk honestly. Tell us what worked for you. So let's support everybody. My approach, the daily practice, I ended up adapting from 12-step recovery. And not everybody does the daily practice. It was like a tiny group of people who did the steps this way. And, uh, and I decided, and I talked to my sponsor about it. I talked to the other people, and I said, I'm going to take this out. And I'm going to share it with people who have CPTSD in a non-12-step context. So therefore, not governed by the traditions. Some of my services are for sale, but never this. The daily practice is always free, as are the free Zoom calls you can come to. I do them every two weeks. You can come and do the specific writing technique and the meditation. It really helps with neurological dysregulation. Check it out. Come try it. You don't have to be a 12-step person. This is our own thing now. This is crappy childhood fairyland. <laughs> And you can come here and take my course anytime. And if you want to sign up for that, it is right here. And I will see you very soon. <laughs>